So I'm going to be talking about AGIs and existential risk. Uh, this is a topic that's been pretty hot lately. It's kind of exploded. There's a community of people that have been talking about it for a long time, um, but it's really kind of hitting the news lately. Uh, and I want to emphasize that here I'm, 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 I'm just outlining the arguments and doing my, the best to withhold my viewpoints, but that's kind of impossible. So there's going to be some bias here. And if there's at any point you think, oh, that doesn't make any sense, uh, and I know why, please talk to me. I'm making a map of all the arguments, uh, and I'm really trying to like get to the bottom of the question in a way that doesn't rely on intuitions or hunches or Twitter gotchas. Yes. What is actually your opinion? So you can, like, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure it will come through. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first thing to say is that by existential, we mean going extinct. Uh, some people seem to think it's euphemistically talking about jobs. No, it really is talking about extinction risks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think it really matters. Um, all right, so. What's Toby Ord's definition of an existential risk? That's the one I'm going to go with. And he says that an existential risk is a risk that threatens the destruction of humanity's long-term potential. So I'm going to weaken the argument a bit and not say that hum uh, AI is going to kill everyone, but instead that there's a reasonable chance that humanity will lose control of AI. And I think that's sufficient because if we're not in control, we no longer steer our future and I think that threatens our long-term potential. So one immediate argument made against this is that this is just sci-fi speculation and it distracts from the very real, very present existing harms from AI in the world. So one of these is reinforced and perpetuated biases. We're all familiar with that. Recently, there's the idea of whether um, the way in which mid-journey and other diffusion models or image generating models are stealing data. <coughs> um, there's deep fakes and the prospect of automated misinformation, lethal autonomous weapons, and the lack of transparency and explainability. So there's an argument to be made that the people worried about this are just Silicon Valley tech bros, completely unaffected by these very real, very present issues, and they've just gone a bit wild with their sci-fi speculations and are not really grounded in reality anymore. The argument I want to make is that speculation actually aids preparation for issues. For all of those issues, if we started speculating a bit earlier, maybe we would have had more time to actually prepare for addressing them. So for example, with the reinforced and perpetuated biases, we could work on defining and evaluating and training for fairness. It took a long time for people to realize that the definition of fairness in, within the context of machine learning was actually quite hard to pin down. And we ended up having some impossibility results showing that there's lots of different ways of formalizing fairness. And it turns out you can't ensure all of them. So there are trade-offs there. And a similar story for the rest of them. But the other argument I want to make against this idea that this just distracts from real world harms and we should forget the argument is that the cat's already out the bag. This is the Daily Mail today. <laughs> <laughs> AI could wipe out humanity. And it's not just the Daily Mail. Here's the Guardian. <laughs> and even the, even the Times is getting on it. AI pioneers fear extinction. I just want to say explicitly, before you think my argument is, it's printed in the Daily Mail, therefore it must be true. That's not my argument. My argument is that we can't just sweep this away anymore. The discussion has to be had. One parallel to this is that, okay, we can speculate, but there's an infinite number of things you can speculate. And at some point you just have to get on with solving problems. So this I would say, with some of the greatest minds speculating on this threat, maybe there's something to this one. 
And if we wait for evidence that AI might take control, will it already be too late? The existing pattern of waiting to see harms before addressing them might lead to a catastrophic outcome with something this powerful. So for it to not even be worth spending time engaging with the discussion, you'd have to be extremely confident that the risk is extremely small. And I think that's just not justified. Okay, enough matter. What is the argument? It starts with the idea of the second species. I think Stuart Russell named this. So this is the idea that of the primates, humans are, or the major primates, humans are physically the weakest and the least agile, and yet we completely dominate the environment. We control it in a way that actually goes against the goals of other primates. And this is because of our intelligence. So why do more intelligent agents seek to control the environment? So this is the argument of instrumental convergence popularized by Nick Bostrom. So this argument says that almost whatever an agent's goal is, uncontrolled parts of the environment might be obstacles and controlled parts of the environment can be tools. And that includes other agents in the environment. Classically, instrumental convergence is focused on things like resources, self-preservation, self-improvement, etc. But these are all just elements of things in the environment, including itself, I suppose, being brought under the control of the agent in order to serve its goal. That's the abstract argument. If you go a bit more concrete, whoops, let's leave that one till later. Oh no, let's do it now. Okay, the, another one that you might, another thing you might want to bring under your control is anything in the environment that could tamper with your goal. And that's because almost whatever your agent's goal is, if its goal is changed, it will likely perform worse at achieving its original goal. A lot of people find this one a bit hard to swallow. So I'm gonna stop and pause for questions at this point. Yeah. It's <laughs> No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, suppose the original agent's goal is G1, yeah. and suppose there's something in the environment that might change its goal to G2. If it doesn't control that part of the environment, its goal might be changed to G2, and then it will pursue G2. And the original agent perceiving this threat will think, if I allow that, then I'll be pursuing G2 rather than G1, and I'll fail most likely at pursuing G1. So I should control that element of the environment. Yeah. Sorry, Ruben, sorry, can I just interrupt for a second? Um, yeah. Just for those of us who are watching online, can you please repeat the question or have the person come up, stand next to the microphone to ask it, just so that we can all understand what you're answering? Sure. So either just repeat what they say or say, do you want to come up and ask? Yeah. Can you summarize it? I don't know. <laughs> just stand where I'm standing. <laughs> uh, so my question was, um, the argument that seems to be being made here is that the agent, after after his goal gets changed, see, will still kind of remember its original goal. And I was asking whether that was the case, and Ruben was responding to that. So I said that it might remember it, but it might not care about it. Yeah. Um, so I are you trying to say here that like because I've read I've read two percent um are you trying to say basically that if it, it, it actually has a terminal goal it might never want to change that because yeah that would fundamentally be a different agent so like it's it's more like a, under the guide of self-preservation so the question is um preserving your own goal is sort of akin to preserving your existence and yes i agree with that that's the argument so just really final quick one this is only true if the New goal is not 
contained within the original goal? Uh, yeah, so the question is, what if the new goal is contained within the old goal? Um, yeah, I suppose that's possible. Uh, the question is just, will your goal being changed to the new goal affect your performance at performing the original goal? And if it like enlarges it, then maybe not. Uh, but like, it's probably better to have, if, if you have a single terminal goal, it's probably better to stick to that rather than adding on extra things to the goal. You'll probably perform worse. But yeah, it's not a guarantee. Okay, I'm gonna have to move on. So if you buy the instrumental convergence argument, the burden of proof now flips. The burden of proof was, why would an agent want to take control? And the new burden of proof is, how can you construct it not to have an incentive to take control? Okay, so a tour of some counter arguments now. First is, this is not true intelligence. True intelligence wouldn't dominate, it would cooperate. It would have the common sense to realize it was on the wrong track when humans complained or tried to switch it off or whatever. And true intelligence would be moral and would be wise. Whatever true intelligence is, it doesn't seem to be the current goal. It's not the path that the AI field is on. The field is currently aiming for capability and the same arguments go through. Instrumental convergence still works if you're talking about capability rather than intelligence. So if you want, just forget I used the word intelligence and substitute the word capability. That said, I completely agree. We should build AI with all of these nice things that true intelligence encompasses. Another argument against instrumental convergence is yes, by default, more capable agents uh, meet their goals, possibly by taking control of the environment. But this is when the odds are even between the two agents, if they're adversaries. So if you're playing a game of chess against a supercomputer and you're white and the supercomputer is black, you don't know how you're going to lose, but you can reliably predict that you are going to lose because it's more capable. But the real world situation with AI might not reflect that situation. It might be more like the game on the right, where the supercomputer has a severe handicap. And you might be confident enough that the handicap is so large that uh, there's just no way the supercomputer could actually win. And win in this analogy is take control. So chess in this analogy is the control game. So how could we make the odds stack in our favor? So one idea is we can restrict the action space. So you can prevent uh, a high bandwidth connection to the internet, uh, or you can only allow it to be connected for a certain amount of time, or you can ensure there's a really uh, accessible off switch, something like that. My problem with this approach is the incentive to control the environment shouldn't be there in the first place. We shouldn't be tying the AI's hands behind its back. We should be making sure it doesn't want to do anything we don't want to do, want it to do in the first place. Also, this doesn't seem to be what companies are currently doing. They currently seem to be, well, take ChatGPT, for example. The goal currently seems to be to connect it to as much, as many things as possible with the plugins. So it's the exact opposite of this strategy. Also, there's economic forces. The greater the restriction of the agent, the less useful it's going to be. And fighting against economics is pretty hard, as the fight against fossil fuel shows. And finally, if AGI is connected to the internet, can we guarantee that no strategy ends in human disempowerment? Is it sufficient to stack the odds a little bit, or do we want them to be stacked entirely in our favor? So what do I mean by that? Well, in a game of chess, the game tree looks a bit like this. There's about 50 moves, sorry, about 20 to 30 moves per go, and the game lasts about 100 moves. In Go, it's a lot bigger. That's why the game took longer. Uh, and the situation with an AI connected to the internet 
would look a bit more like this. Trying to get more branches, but this was the best picture I could find. The point I'm making is that how can you guarantee that none of these leaves on this tree uh, end in the AI having the control over humans? The action space is just ridiculously large. And if we can't guarantee that there's uh, a strategy that leads to AI taking control, then we're in the situation where as we continue to create more and more powerful agents, it becomes more and more likely that an agent finds one of those paths. The incentive to take control is what should be eliminated. Yeah. Um, I think we can, so the question is what does control mean concretely? Uh, I think I'm just going to go with the intuitive sense of control for the moment. I, I think the details are not that relevant. I think most people can understand if an AI has control over you, that's a bad thing, whatever it means. I'm going to have to move on because I've got a lot to get through. Okay, another argument. This is all a bit silly. Can't we just pull the plug? <laughs> Kim Jong-un has an off switch. It's about there, but somehow no one can get to it. <laughs> Having an off switch is useless if it comes under the agent's control. And that's what I was already talking about. The incentive is there to control the environment. And programming the AI to not mind being switched off is actually a lot more difficult than it sounds. And there's a QR code uh, if you want to look into that. But yeah, I'll give you a second to <laughs> scan that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I won't repeat that question. <laughs> okay, so how are some other ways in which uh, AI could prevent itself being switched off? So one is that we could become directly reliant on it. So AI might provide services that we don't want to give up, just like fossil fuels, and this would give AI leverage. Another idea is indirect reliance. So the AI might become embedded into crucial systems that we don't want to give up, like the internet. If you switch the internet off, things don't end well. Uh, you can Google it, it's quite uh, interesting what actually happens, but it's something like the energy grids go all out of whack because they're controlled by the internet. Once the energy grids go out of whack, people are fighting for fuel and the army gets involved, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah, have a read about it, it's fun. Okay, <laughs> another counter argument. Let's build tools, not agents. So some argue ChatGPT is not an agent. It doesn't run any risk of taking things over or gaining control. It's just a tool that you can use for your purposes, however you wish. And the risk is only in misuse. So my problem with this is it's not actually clear what is an agent and what isn't. ChatGPT isn't an agent with the goal of predicting the next word, obviously, because if it was, it would direct the conversation in a way that made the following tokens easier to predict. So for example, it could start, I know a song that will get on your nerves and then just continue that forever. That would be easy. Uh, but instead, it just predicts the next word with no consideration about whether that makes other words harder or easier to predict. The second argument is that while ChatGPT is a tool, it can be used as a tool to create agents or to simulate agents. So if I say to ChatGPT, let's play noughts and crosses, it begins to simulate a noughts and crosses playing agent. It's actually terrible, but that's besides the point. In the limit, language models could be very good at this kind of thing. Uh, I could also say, let's play Conquer Europe, and it just assumes that's a game and starts playing along. <laughs> uh, 
this which I don't mean for that one to be taken seriously. Um, okay, and the final argument against this tools versus agents thing is that there's an economic incentive to create agents. We want our AIs to actually do things for us in the world rather than just talking to us. A really good post on the large language models as simulators of agents can be found on that QR code. The other argument is that language models can be embedded into uh, language agents. So that's an AI where you have a language model at its core and then several files that it's connected to which contain things like beliefs, desires, plans, knowledge, memories, things like that. And the AI can then, in a feedback loop, so I think auto GPT is an example of this, can start acting as an agent. The simulated agent becomes a real agent acting in the world. So why is there an economic incentive to create agents rather than tools? Well, imagine a conversation 30, 50 years hence that goes like this. You ask your AI for a business plan and it outputs a PDF of 17 terabytes. And you say in conversation with it, how uh, can you explain it simply? The AI says, not really, it is extremely complicated. The human says, give it a go in a couple sentences. AI, imagine a wolf hunting in a forest as part of a pack. He peels away, distracted, distracted by a rotting corpse. Later, he hears the other wolves yelp as they tumble down a ravine. Human, am I meant to be the lone wolf here? AI, yes. Human, that doesn't make any sense. AI, I did mention it was complicated. With less than one billion sentences, metaphors are the best I can do. Would you like me to enact the plan? So <laughs> I can imagine something a bit like this happening, but obviously this is a, a, a bit of a silly example. But put yourself in the shoes of a CEO with this kind of situation where this is the context. If your economic rivals are using the AI as an agent rather than a tool that you have to then process the plans of, and they start getting ahead economically, you have an enormous incentive to follow along. And you have an enormous incentive to do it before they do it. Fighting against economics is, is pretty hard. Okay, one quick one. This is just sci-fi nonsense. It's a reductio ad absurdum. Your conclusion is so bizarre that I know you must have gone wrong somewhere. And my response is, when you're trying to predict how the future will go, your prediction will always sound like sci-fi nonsense. To a person from 1950, the world today would have sounded like sci-fi nonsense. And if business as usual continues, i.e. exponential technological growth, then the future will sound like sci-fi nonsense to us and in a shorter amount of time. Moore's law looks to be steadily continuing and the bitter lesson argues that most AI progress is through computational um, increases rather than sophisticated algorithms. So yeah, it doesn't look great from that perspective. Maybe you can see my uh, personal view coming through at this point. <laughs> okay, another argument, AGI is impossible. I think this is just easy to refute with Stuart Russell's quote, but that's as if a bus driver with all of humanity as passengers said, yes, I'm driving as fast as I can towards a cliff, but trust me, we'll run out of gas before we get there. I'd rather not take the risk. Several AI companies have as their explicit goal to create AGI. A relevant, uh, sorry, a related counter argument is that AGI is ages away. And the simple response to that is that a solution to this control problem, defeating instrumental convergence might also be a long time away. And you should also have a wide distribution over when you think this level of AI is coming. 
rather than a single point estimate. So why should it be large? Why should it have a large variance? Well, first, AGI might be possible within the deep learning framework. It's not clear that it's not possible. If so, there could be three possible bottlenecks, data, compute, or clever algorithms. And the smarter the algorithms are, for example, architectures on optimization tricks, the lower the thresholds on data and compute you need to get to a certain level of AI. So if the bottleneck is algorithmic progress, then things are also really uh, uncertain because algorithmic progress is so hard to predict and unexpected things sometimes happen to work. So your distribution should look less like the green for when this level of AI will come and more like the red where there's a decent chance it comes before 2080, which I'm assuming is in your lifetime. And in fact, a risk great enough to worth, be worth insuring against. Okay, what if we set the AI's goal to serve humanity? Well, this would indeed dissolve the instrumental convergence argument. An agent with this goal doesn't seek to control seize control from humanity, because that wouldn't be serving humanity. It doesn't seek to control resources when this conflicts with humanity's wishes. It allows itself to be switched off, and it allows its goal to be changed, because that's what humanity would want if they try and do it. Problem solved. Not so fast. There's two issues. The first is, what does serve humanity mean? Even if you could for, uh, sorry, even if you don't need to formalize it, and instead you can have a language agent respond to your instructions, we have conflicting interests as a species, and there's no agreed way to aggregate them. If you do a bunch of philosophy and come up with the right way to aggregate interests, whatever that means, it's not the case that all humans are going to agree to that. So there's always going to be resistance. And the word set, if we set the agent's goal, hides two enormous problems, outer alignment and inner alignment. So outer alignment is <coughs> whether you can actually set the right goal, whether you can formalize it in a way that the machine can understand. And inner alignment is how do you build an agent that actually embodies that goal, that actually takes on that goal as its own. So let's have some examples to clear this up. Here's an example of outer alignment failure. Dario Amade at OpenAI wanted the agent to finish the boat race, but he gave the wrong reward function because finishing the race is actually a hard thing to formalize, but getting points is much easier to formalize because the game does that for you. And that means that the agent ends up valuing points as a terminal goal rather than an instrumental goal to finishing the game. And so it pursues this bizarre strategy of just picking up points round and round in a circle without ever actually finishing the game. So this is outer alignment failure, the wrong reward function or the wrong objective was specified. And then there's inner alignment failure, which is when even if you have the right reward function, the agent fails to embody that correct goal. So here we have an agent that's trained to collect the gold coin, and the reward function was, have you got the gold coin? So you would assume, oh, well, the agent will have the goal, collect the gold coin. But if you change the place of the gold coin, you see that the agent's goal is not that. It hops straight over the gold coin, and just runs to the end of the level. So this was just a problem of uh, exploration. The environments weren't widely varied enough to be able to distinguish between these two interpretations of the reward function. So it's just no surprise that it could pick up on the wrong thing or start aiming for the wrong thing. So <laughs> there's an example of this with humans and evolution. Evolution is an optimizer, and it optimized us with a reward function being the number of offspring. 
So naively you would think, okay, it produces agents that try and maximize their number of offspring. No, it produce, ends up producing agents that have the internalized goal of eating lots of food and having lots of sex, even if that's protected sex. So you end up with agents that absolutely don't maximize their number of offspring. Instead, you could just go to the sperm bank. So a, a nice graphic for this is that outer misalignment is when you have the incorrect reward function. So if the green dotted line is the correct reward function, then if you've just messed it up and specified the wrong one, then that's the red line. And then inner misalignment is when the agent generalizes the red line incorrectly. You can't, with deep learning at least, you can't impute, you can't demonstrate the entire reward function. You instead give instances of reward in specific states. So that would be the solid part of the red line here. And the agent then extrapolates that if, if it does indeed end up pursuing the goal, which might be misaligned with the true reward function or the reward function you intended. And that's no surprise because it's just got no way to tell whether the green or the red is the, the right one, given only the solid red curve. How long do I have left? Okay, at least in that time. Okay, I think this might be one of the biggest cruxes in the whole debate. <clears throat> so Jan LeCun argues that this will be a process of iterative refinement. We'll get things wrong, sure, but that's the same with any technology. And you can just improve as you go along. And Yudikowski responds, well, this wasn't actually a response, it's just two separate tweets. Uh, responds, or he, he believes that getting it wrong on the first try will kill you on that first try and not let you try again. So why is there such a massive divergence in view here? I believe it's about, uh, well, the, the an analogy to evolution is pretty instructive here. So, the green line is the intelligence of evolution as an optimizer. And it's not increasing, it's just static. And its tools are counting how many offspring you have and how many deaths. Whereas humans trained by evolution eventually exceed the intelligence of evolution and they create their own culture, which is like a runaway second evolution of increasing capabilities. And they can use that to completely wipe the floor with whatever optimization uh, evolution was applying to them and just direct, start directing their own future. So for example, with medicine that reduces deaths and then with genetic engineering, you're just like completely eliminating this, uh, this force of inclusive genetic fitness. So one argument is that maybe we'll end up in the same position with AI. If it starts being able to do, if it starts being able to do its own AI research, then you get like a second runaway process and that human intelligence might be increasing, but it might be at a much slower rate than AI intelligence. Okay, so deceptive alignment and the sharp left turn. So, with these five things, if an agent has the capability to do these five things, then it will act aligned, even though it's not. So one, if it has the capability to deduce that it is an agent, so it has a model of its own existence and its place in the world. If it has the capability to deduce that its goal diverges from humanities, to deduce that if it reveals this divergence, it will be shut down in all likelihood. That if it hides this divergence, it will gain trust and be given a larger action space, for example, access to greater resources or uh, wider internet access. And if it can deduce that with a larger action space, it may be able to seize control, then it might act aligned, passes all the tests and builds trust 
uh, until it has this opportunity of seizing control. So in, that, uh, in this scenario, we say that the AI is deceptively aligned and the point at which it turns against the humans and seizes control is called the sharp left turn. So I, I think what Yudkowsky really has in mind when he says that you get one try and then it's over is recursive self-improvement. That once AI be out, uh, is able to evolve its own knowledge, uh, do AI research and otherwise improve itself, then you might get a runaway process that's extremely hard to control. So I'm imagining this as uh, a red ball on a hill. The AI is the ball. Humans are pushing it around, changing its goal, uh, however they like to, to, to get it to do things they want it to do and increasing its capabilities. But there's a point of, at which it becomes harder and harder to change the goals of the agent. And the analogy here is that if it goes off the hill, then you have to start applying a lot more force to get it back. And it might accelerate until you can't control it anymore. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just, I feel like this recurrent self like has a lot of hidden assumptions, like assuming that like, just because you're super intelligent or you know, super general, it means that you can AI research exponentially faster, which I feel like is a big assumption, right? Like even the smartest human, like this we have like an AI that's just only the smartest people in the world and then like, it would still take ages to do AI. It's like, things just take a long time. So yeah. I, I, I guess, I don't know, it's a recursive argument. Like, so, the recursive argument is like, it requires a fast data. So like, I don't know why we necessarily get fast data. So. Yeah, so the argument is that recursive self-improvement is just very hard or might be very hard and an agent being able to do it actually hides a lot of hidden assumptions. Um, yeah. What are those assumptions? Like, like that agent being the AI researcher. What if it, like, what if it's super intelligent, like physics, but actually can't do AI then? Like, or, like, what, like, if we're doing the hypothesis, yeah, I think they might have any agents, but, like, the, the assumption that request self improvement is A, because self improvement everything, and B, specifically AI, that will like magically increase, like, our information. So that's a big like, assumption. I, th I think we might have to leave that discussion for, for afterwards because the, the people on, on Zoom can't hear it. Um, but yeah, we'll get back to that later. Okay, so one idea is that maybe language agents solve outer and inner alignment. Uh, so yeah, here's a great piece by a philosopher on uh, language agents or claiming that language agents reduce the risk of existential catastrophe. So the argument is essentially it solves outer alignment, which is specifying the correct objective, because language agents can be given goals in natural language. You don't have to formalize it in an equation uh, or a function to be optimized. You can just say, I want X. And it solves inner alignment, it's claimed, because language agents have the common sense to generalize instructions as a human would, rather than in some really dumb way that a reinforcement learning agent might. I am skeptical about this proposal, but I do think it's like one of the best options um, because at least it's much more interpretable what's actually going on in the language agent. So if you have a language model interacting with a bunch of files around it that tell it its goals, its beliefs, its memories, its knowledge, then you can actually inspect those files and see what's going on. And that just seems like a much safer scenario than when it's a big black box and you don't have any idea what's, uh, what the inner thought process is. Yes? Sorry? So the question is, you can't inspect 17 terabytes. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the weaknesses. Yeah. Sorry, for the sake of this argument, I think it's very important to consider that we can't even do this right to humans. We can't even align ourselves properly using language. So like, why would we even do it to machines? Yeah, the, the question is, we can't even align humans with language, so why would we expect to do it with machines? I think my response to that is, uh, 
if language agents resemble simulated humans, then I think the situation is better than if we have AIs that re resemble alien minds that we don't understand at all. But I agree, it's still a massive uh, obstacle to overcome. Okay, and finally, none of this touches at all upon bad, reckless, and naive actors. Even if all of this is fine in terms of agents seeking control, you still have people in the world who will ish, uh, wish ill for other people, who are completely reckless with safeguards, or who are just completely naive and uh, don't really understand the issues and haven't heard the arguments. And I think this becomes extremely pressing uh, if Moore's law continues for another few decades and we get to the point where you can train extremely powerful agents on your laptop. If anyone, else, if anyone in the world has access to essentially intelligence on tap, I think that's an extremely dangerous situation to be in. Okay, so that was the first talk of the discussion series. I hope that sort of got you in the mood for the rest of them. Uh, we have three uh, talks, uh, each a fortnight after the other, starting on Wednesday, the 14th of June. Um, so Ivan Wegner is gonna talk about tools versus agents, expanding this idea of can we limit uh, AIs to just being tools rather than agents? And also what I touched on slightly at the end, which is the social and economic landscape and the problem of bad actors. Then we have a joint event with Nello Cristianini and Chris Watkins, and they're gonna debate machines can eventually be expected to think in a human-like way. And I think this is interesting, perhaps from the language agent perspective of if your AI thinks in a human-like way, maybe you can apply human folk psychology to predicting what it's going to do next, uh, to reasoning with it, to changing its goals or whatever, rather than dealing with an alien mind. And then finally, we have Marco Loch uh, from Radboud University, a uh, topic to be confirmed, but he's on the 12th of July. Then there'll be a summer break, and then Mirko Muzalesi is giving one in October. And yeah, the invitation is open. If you thought what I said was absolutely bonkers, hogwash, I'd love to have you give a talk uh, on, your, on your views. And if you're too timid to give a talk, I'm building up this map of debates on the question. Uh, so you can, you can find that on this QR code. Um, if your opinion isn't in here, or if one of the arguments is crap, please let me know. I'd love to get like a full map of everything that's going on here. So that rather than people doing Twitter takedowns, they can instead say, uh, I'm here on the map. Uh, this is my crux. So red are arguments for danger, green are arguments for safety, and orange are cruxes, where it seems to me to be uh, uncertain what the answer is. Yeah. There are some questions in the, in the oh. Q&A. Yes, let's take a look at the Q&A. Um, so someone asks, to what extent do you think the personification of AI has contributed to the increase in discussion in comparison to other existential threats? e.g. when it was thought that the LHC, LHC was going to make a black hole. Has the, <laughs> has the recent research indicating that emergent properties of LLMs might be a function of performance metric changed your view on the immediate, immediacy of AI X risk? Okay, so two questions. Uh, yeah, the personification is a real problem. I think that people are beginning to think of ChatGBT as a person that you can talk with, where instead, if you look at the previous post, I think it's better to think about it as a simulator of agents that's been fine-tuned to act like a, uh, a helpful agent. Um, but we don't know exactly how they behave. The language of all, the space of all possible sentences is absolutely vast. There might be adversarial sentence examples, just like for image uh, classifiers, that just completely throw off language models in completely unexpected ways. So for most humans, I think there's probably not such a thing as an adversarial sentence that just causes them to go haywire. 
But I think for a language model, there could be, and that's a real worry. And we might miss it if we can if we fall into the trap of thinking and treating them as humans. Uh, as for the emergent properties, yeah, I believe totally that makes the uh, makes the, the the matter more pressing, uh, and it makes it harder to for to do the kind of approach that Jan the Kuhn is advocating advocating for, which is this iterative approach. If capabilities suddenly pop uh, into existence. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. But if you will have, for example, discontinuous performance measures like accuracy, you can see these sudden increases in discontinuous increases that have been made in emergent behaviors. And it's actually just a matter of measures. And we believe that we've shown that this is a bit confusing or misleading. Okay. So, a response from Jean is that while the cross entropy, uh, while the accuracy or some discontinuous metric might jump, if you look at the cross entropy or some continuous metric that it's trained on, that probably varies very smoothly. I think the question was asking about the way I like the question is, are you still afraid of existential risk given that recent work has shown that these emergent behaviors might actually not be emergent, but just a like phenomenon based on inappropriate performance metrics? Yeah, so Jean's asking, is the emergence just a uh, artifact of the inappropriate metric we're using? Uh, and if so, are you less worried? Um, I think I'm still worried because like, at what point does, at what value of cross entropy do you get to where it becomes dangerous? It's not really obvious. What we're interested in is the capabilities and those are discontinuous metrics. So if they're hard to predict, then it seems like a dangerous situation. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. So could you discuss the changing goal analogy again? It's not clear to me why changing a goal makes performance worse. Couldn't it also make performance better? Okay, so a concrete example is, uh, say you're a parent and you love your children and someone says, uh, hey, take this drug, it'll make you want to kill your children. Uh, you're probably not gonna take that drug because then you, you just can't care for your children anymore. Um, is it possible that you could take a drug that would change your goal to make you care for your children better? Well, yeah, I suppose. If, you're, if you have depression uh, and you take a drug that stops you being depressed and focusing on the end of the world, then you might take care of your children better. Um, but does that actually change your goal? I'm not sure. I think it's hard to think of an example where it actually changes your goal and yet enables you to achieve the original goal better. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. It's serious. Um, you've given a lot of good uh, potential changes that can face in the future. But there's one that we face right now, and that's that governments can use these AI tools to exert massive control of the population. Um, maybe it's not happening so much in the UK, but in other countries in the world, uh, we see this already taking place. Uh, don't you think this is a much more pressing danger than AGI? <laughs> Uh, so the question, if I summarize it correctly, is uh, isn't the danger of governments using language models to influence um, no, no, populations no, no. more pressing? Models, like, uh, uh, Sorry, any AI. Facial recognition, yeah. uh, you know, um, heat sensors, body, you know, body movement, like where you are, tracking devices. This is AGI as well, it's not only language. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the question is more like, what about any AI capabilities being used to suppress populations? Yeah. Because we can see that with the current technology, you can suppress more population, greater population, uh, easily with less resources. But the question is, what's stopping us from turning into the 1980s for society before we develop a Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question of like, is, is government influence a greater risk? I mean, possibly. I don't really have a good answer to that. Like, yeah, if we end up in 1984, then that seems as big a uh, destruction of humanity's potential as uh, AI taking control. Um, it doesn't seem likely to end in the death of all humanity, 
which AI seems like it could. So maybe that's a silver lining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the problem is I haven't argued for everyone being dead. I've just argued for the lack of control. So that'd be a separate discussion. Um, yeah. Play dead or sovereign dead? It seems like the argument, for example, uh, on the Twitter Sanchez TV show has already happened for many other tools, like one concept in regards to NHC like black hole. And I guess Manhattan Project, people not actually knowing for sure whether it was going to like destroy the whole earth. So I guess my really devil's advocate view to this is does it matter at all that people care about this right now if there will always be some agents like humans that for economic or geopolitical reasons will just take the risk and go war with advancing the capabilities of technology, neglecting the fact that you will destroy everyone? Um, so your question is, like, does it make sense to even to, like, is it worth talking about these risks when someone's going to do it anyway? Well, I'm, yeah, kind of. I'm sure, I mean, it's, it's playing devil's advocate, but like, I'm sure that scientists raised their hand with the NHC or the project for cancer cases, and yet there were bigger drivers that pushed decision makers to give it a go anyway. So, yeah, I mean, the NHC is not a good example because Manhattan. that wasn't going to. <laughs> um, there, wasn't, there wasn't sufficient evidence yeah, to know for sure whether they could control the power of it. Yeah, yeah. The Manhattan Project is a good example. Um, I don't know. You've got to try your best. I don't know what more I can say. We're talking about these issues. I'm, I'm going to end the call now. And uh, yeah, but email me if you have more questions. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all those who've attended live streaming and attended in person. Um, we will send information about the next discussion series um, soon. But thank you very much, Ruben, for starting it all off and being the student leading this entire debate series. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon.